I am unashamed. What about you? And we're off. And we're off. You, Zach, you're still good? We we just had liftoff. I'm good. I was, Zach, I was just good. with I'm Zach. Gucci. Did you know that? Well, I was. I knew you weren't at church yesterday because I was there. I was in North you, Carolina. You missed. I mean, look, Al. Fantastic. I know. I heard how great it the was. The worship was off the charts good. I mean, this was this was a long way from bringing in the sheaves, <laughs> which which is a personal joke that just happened. Because I I want you to know we were doing ads, and one of our ads was uh, one of our sponsors is a sheet. Company. Well, I thought that now that was my bad. <laughs> I I thought the song we used to sing when I was a teenager was bringing in the sheet. <laughs> Which, and, uh, which, think about that. Why would there be a song called Bringing in the Sheets? Because I thought you put them on a clothesline. Yeah. Out. I thought the song was written in like 1890 when you put sheets on a, on a clothesline. Okay, I can outside. see that. So somebody well, what would be said the it, spiritual connotation to bring it in the sheet? Well, it's bedtime. <laughs> you need to bring in the sheet. I thought it was like, <laughs> we're fixed to die. You know how morbid some of these old songs can be. Oh, so we're going to sleep. Okay. We're going to sleep. I got we're it. going I got to sleep it. with okay. Jesus. I'm with yeah. you, man. I thought wow. it was a theological man, night. That's it's a little over. bit morbid, but lights. yeah. Party I saver. Come to find out. 30 years later that it's actually bringing in the sheaves. So I asked, well, for, well, first that, yeah. Okay. I asked the, the, thesaur, the human thesaurus, <laughs> or <laughs> I think I called him Mr. Webster. Yeah. What sheaves meant. And he didn't know. <laughs> he, so he Googles it, but he, but he misspelled. Oh, he didn't misspell. No, he used no, the wrong he, version. He's well, I asked him, can you use no, it? I misspelled it. it. I, I spelled it with two. I spelled it with two E's sheaves. And, and what came up was a, what was it? A Some kind of with wheel a with a groove in it. Oh, I thought, well, that didn't make any sense. Why would you be bringing in a wheel? <laughs> with a groove in it. In the church building. Bringing in the wheel with a groove in it. <laughs> so then I, I just went off on a tangent about that's the problem when you, you're, I mean, I, I feel like the young people should be the lifeblood of any church because they have the most energy and they're the most open-minded for Jesus. And uh, so... Me, I was frustrated about singing a song about bringing in the sheaves. We did, by the way, so clear even... it up. So it was S H E A V E S. And a lot of older people out there remember the song, Bring in the Sheaves, which we looked that word up, and it's bundles of wheat, the sheaves. Well, when's the last so time you brought in, in a harvest? bundle of wheat? <laughs> Well, I've never brought in one. Well, it's, but it's a it's a metaphor for the harvest. The harvest, bringing in the it's harvest. It's a metaphor for the harvest. It's too Which, complicated. Which, to Phil's point, you didn't grow up. Well, you, it, well, if it would have been to bring in the, the crappie, bring in the white perch, or bring in the, bring in the, the catfish, fish. Right. the opolistic well, catfish, you would have been like, Because oh, you are fishers of men, not well, sheaves. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well I'm just not saying. A farmer. Not everyone is a farmer. They understand sheaves, but... But you say, what about the fishermen? So it's for those two. I'm just saying every 10, 20, 30, 100 years, let's update the worship songs. All right? So the kids are not frustrated. That's all the point I was making. But that has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. But I was saying, I was there yesterday. I thought it was fantastic. They had the women's retreat. And so basically the women kind of did the... I mean, how do you say that? What's the correct way to say it? They took over. It was it was a take. Yeah, it was a women centric Sunday um, because yeah. of the retreat. It was fantastic. But what I thought was, uh, y'all you know, went way back. The woman who spoke, well, I guess, was, there was th- three or four women that spoke. But the keynote, I guess, was Mindy, who was on our podcast before, and uh, and she didn't necessarily tell her story. She told God's story. Yeah, it's awesome. Very biblical but it made me think when she was a teenager and this uh event happened to her that she shared when she she was on an earlier podcast uh that resulted in her mom being murdered yeah being being buried and her dad being in prison for the rest of his life she uh you know we all kind of rallied around her and her sister and so uh, and it, it made me think of that illustration because also one of the other women who spoke was uh, Caitlin, who I taught in junior high, which tells you how old I'm getting. And it was mm. powerful. But her mom 
which is one of the uh, pastor's wives, that, who's a counselor, by the way. We were having a conversation after the service about that. And she, because she was like, you know, tears of joy and proud of her daughter. And but she's like, you know, just thank you for those those classes, you know, you taught. And it did make me think, you know, here's, here's, here's two women who, when you go back to uh, when they were teenagers, it made me think of that illustration I used on the past few podcasts, you know, about an acre not being powerful until it's planted and you give it some time and it begins to grow. And then all of a sudden it, it is a sign of strength. And I thought, boy, if you want to see two oaks disguised as women yesterday, I mean, that was, that was, fan- they did fantastic. Which is one of the beauties of being somewhere for a while, Jace, because I have these kind of experiences all the time here is getting to watch people grow up and getting to see what God does when, you know, getting to see him grow people to that point, which is really amazing. I mean, it just, it humbles yeah, you. I'm, I, I'm, I view, a lot of people in that congregation. I've been there fifty years, or so. So, when you look at them, when you study with them, and bring them, help bring them to Jesus, point them to Jesus, and they do. Well, it's amazing that you just look up one day, and the gray hair is there. When I, the last time I saw them, really talk with them, they were. Teenagers. Yeah, they flourished. Yeah, junior high on up to, you know, eighth, ninth, tenth grade. You look at them, but then all of a sudden they pass you by, and their hair is gray as yours. No, <laughs> so I know. Well, I, I, I tell them, I say, I remember you when you were a little girl. So the, some of the older women there now, they have got a house full of kids, and they come on up through the, it's the ranks. You know, bringing in the sheaves became a reality. <laughs> 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 That's well, I told her, but it's it, pretty cool to see him because it seems like yesterday I was talking with you, and you, you know, I taught, you know, like physical education and all that when I was getting on my feet, and I did make the comment to Miss K. I stayed there a couple of years to get on my feet spiritually, and I was teaching the sons and daughters of the congregation there. Mm-hmm. So, well, exactly. Then you look up one day, and lo and behold, they have gray hair, and they have children that are in the fourth and fifth grade, you know. You're teaching the parents of the one Jesus is talking about. That but that's what I'm children. saying. I mean, look. And they, they all remember too. I said, I remember you. I'd give a little hug. I said, I remember you when you were just a little girl. And about, child. About, what was it, eighth grade? She said seventh, seventh grade. Mm-hmm. I said, seventh grade, I remember you. Yeah. Well, don't underestimate it. It made me think of that verse uh, in James 1 where it says, let's see, where is the one I'm looking for? The word that's planted in you, which can save you. Where does it say that at? Uh, oh, yeah. In uh, 21, it says, humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Mm-hmm. Uh, There's the it, sheaves, the planting. Yeah. The well, harvest. The girl that led worship, Erin, you know, she was in our Holy War class years ago. And I remember she came from kind of a traditional uh song service i guess and i remember her you know her her being there i mean she was a little uncomfortable you know with doing something different i guess yeah. is the right word to say and uh so i i went up to her after it was over i was like well we've come a long way since holy roar because it was that was a dynamic worship and she, she kind of had a far away look and she said you know we really have <laughs> but uh so it just i kind of had that Oh, I was, I was proud, but I, I was telling the pastor's wife as we were talking, I said, but look, we need to find the next set of teenagers. She was like, you're right. Cause really you, you realize that I, I just feel like, uh, I hope that, you know, even by doing these podcasts and, and the ministries we do, I mean, you always got to be looking at that group, I think based on their energy of of planting the next seeds, you know, and uh, and sharing Jesus with them. I was, I was like, we need to investigate what's going on with that group right now. And she's like, I'm in. So it was a good conversation, but I think you see how the point was, you see how people grow. It's interesting what you describe those, because so much as you find those out of different, uh, you find those in different fields, 
you mentioned the two uh, sisters from yesterday, Jays. You think about where those two sisters came from, one out of a field of complete tragedy and loss, you know, talking about parents, lose both the parents. But she became an orphan overnight because mother killed, father arrested and taken away to prison for, for life. And out of that, a forever family surrounding her and basically raising her and being a part of that. And then the other one, totally different. Parents, you know, leadership, you know, raising a nurturing home, all those. N- not perfect, but at the same time, very strong, very structured. They and yet, still had to both find their way. Both had to find their way. Well, it, it reminded me of the two sons in the uh, in the Luke 15. That's exactly so, right. So you had two daughters of the of families here, and one out of tragedy. One, same struggle as far as... Uh, it's just a different set. You know, you struggle with self-righteousness and, right. and you know, if you're not in Jesus, you're out. But, you, but Jesus, working you know. together. It reminded me when uh, Lisa and I used to work in a marriage uh, class and ministry together at WFR with a couple, uh, Tommy and Beverly Emman. And it was amazing because we worked together with them very closely. And Tommy and Beverly were so unlike Lisa and I because we had come out of just terrible things and awful, you know, background in marriage. And they were just the opposite. They had been very strong and didn't have a lot of bad things that had happened in their marriage. And yet together we worked perfectly because we worked with all kind of couples that had a varying degree of background. Some had had similar stories to us, but some similar to them. And it took it takes all kinds in the, in the kingdom. And that's the beauty of it. You work together on both spectrums of both ends of, you know, some experiencing some things, some the other. So, I mean, it's a perfect example of what a forever family looks like. I mean, kingdom living is representative of all kinds, which is the beauty of it. So while you guys were there, of course, Dad, you had a you had a class full of podcast listeners, right? People from all over the country. Had come. All over the country from one state after the other. The, they had a little a room, a hole about 75. They were all there. And I just found out pretty quick that they were from all parts of the United States, you know. We all came together there to, as a group. So I was thankful for the for the little black box. I said, <laughs> I said, I can't be, I said, I, I don't have a cell phone. It's I said, but, phone, but, but they, they do. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny because Dad always famously says he doesn't have a cell phone, but because you guys do, you're able to come. And, and we tell you guys all the time, I mention it because there's new listeners, uh, 9 o'clock Sunday mornings, Dad's always <clears throat> doing the Unashamed Bible Study at WFR, so you're always welcome to come. He's going to be there. I say the same thing pretty well every Sunday morning. Right. And I just keep the main thing, <laughs> keep the main thing, the main thing. It doesn't change, does it, Dad? Nope. And uh, so I was in— Well, just about the time you're— Go ahead, Dad. Just about the time you're you're just about the time you're uh, tired of saying it that people are starting to hear it. it. It's interesting you repeat the same thing over and over. But uh, I think Charles Spurgeon said he preached the gospel for like two years straight, every single. I, I can't remember the exact number, but he said I just same 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 sermon every Sunday. I think it was Spurgeon that said that. So you think that I always think that too. Like, well, I've said this before, but you know. So the, it, it, the simplicity and the centrality of the gospel, Phil. Yeah, it, it doesn't get old. I mean, because— Well, it shouldn't. I mean, it's the point. Just take a look at the writers of what we're studying, including Peter. Just look at his background, and you wouldn't think when you're reading about his struggles about Jesus being who he said he was. I mean, he's the one—Peter's the one that jumped in the middle of it and said, you know, you, you know nobody, nobody's going to kill you. We're not going to let that happen. Just think about how far off he was in his understanding while he was running with Jesus. And then Jesus kept asking him there. And I think Luke records, you know, you know, you, you love me. Jesus said, you love me, Peter. He said, oh, I love you. No, that's John. John 21. John. Yeah. yeah. Do you love me? He asked him about three times, but do you love me? Because he had had some. A little static. Well, he denied him three times, so Jesus asked him three times, are you sure you love me? And he and he he ended up with God allowing him to write two books in this word word we're studying here. That's right. Like, boy, what a God that will just bring him can bring him on, on board. And he's the one saying, You're never gonna save the world by dying on a cross. Well, that was kind of the whole point. Jesus was there, but but he was very patient. 
with one Kyle Peter. Yeah, never too, the love of Christ never too far. Let's take a break. So I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but the last time I was on the road, which was just the other day, we go into the Airbnb that they got for us. And when I pulled back the covers from my bed, there were three beds, and I was I was carrying the stuff in. So my two companions, Jeff and Murray, they got the first two beds. And when I pulled back the covers, there were no sheets. Ooh. I thought, who does this? <laughs> this is, no, a spectacular play. And it's like, as, as great as this place was, you know what I concluded? If you have no sheets, it's terrible. <laughs> I thought maybe they had some kind of deal going, bring your own sheets. <laughs> well, I think they did, but I didn't get the memo. <laughs> if I would have, I would have packed up these bowl and bread sheets. You know where my mind went on it? I thought, what happened on the sheets? Well, maybe Why they are not here. Maybe they were ahead of themselves because they knew how much all of us on this podcast loved our bowl and branch sheets. So, in the future, Jay's, when you pack your gear, you always put in a pair of bowl and branch sheets to take with I you. I think I will, just in case that ever. That's happens. a great point. You know, you know, never forget your sheets. Pack your bowl and branch. That's yeah. exactly. That's how much we love these sheets. They use the highest quality threads on earth. These sheets are made from slow-grown organic cotton, uh, buttery to the touch. They're loved by millions, have over 10,000 rave reviews. Uh, they're designed to feel incredible for all sleepers. They give you a 30-night risk-free guarantee with free shipping and returns, which you will not want to return these sheets. We love them. Uh, make the most of bedtime with bowling. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm like, if they could make the sheets actually taste like butter, <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> you wake up in the middle of the night for a snack and just lick them. <laughs> say, I'm trying to, I'm I'm trying like, to do it at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading from the copy here. Well, I don't touch things and say, oh, that 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 feels like butter. They feel buttery to the touch. No, you don't feel butter. You taste butter. They feel so. buttery to the touch and are super breathable. Maddie, are you seeing why you don't want involvement from the from the peanut gallery? You seeing why you leave it to the professional? All right, let's let's take this. Let's land the plane. So make the most of bedtime with bowl and branch sheets. You get fifteen percent off your first order. We use the promo code Robertson at bowlandbranch.com. Exclusions apply. See site for detail. That's Bowl and Branch, B O L L A N D Branch.com. Use the promo code Robertson for buttery sheets. <laughs> so I had an all night study session last night. I hadn't done that in a while. All night? All night. Never slept? Never slept. Is this the one that you said you had the, uh, you started off when we first got a, opened up the studio today, you said you had something that was going to oh. blow our minds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is, this is going to be like, you know how you have, you're studying and you, you're like, oh, oh, wow. Oh my goodness. So at some point we'll. Uh, you you can wait for. I'm preparing your minds right now. There will be a point in this study that you're going to go, oh wow! I guarantee you, I, I discovered something you've never noticed before. But we won't get there now, right? That's for later. Oh, we can. <laughs> I, say, I say we. I say we hang on to it. Okay. That's a great tease, right there. That's right. So so you had me for the. I'll last build it up because because what happened was here, I kind of had an epiphany last night, which is why I couldn't sleep. And it's okay because I slept three days before, <laughs> so I slept for about three days. Because you were still catching up from your island. I experience. went to the island. It was raining pollen. We were working 12, 14 hours a day. It was, there was drama, you know. And we had the little one this weekend, which was not our little one. And so we've, we've, we're now in a new role, a new, what they call a new season of life. We're kind of the grandparents, I guess. And so uh, 
So there was a, you know, I think, I, you know, I was feeling good about that and, and the, where we're at in the process. But so I just started studying. I was like, I, I was having trouble with Second Peter. I mean, we're halfway through this book pretty much. Even though we're in the first chapter, there's only three chapters. So I guess a third of the way. And I'm like, man, this, this, this book seems a little morbid. I mean, because I kept reading it over and over again. Right. You know how you do. Because he's about and to And I die. saw your outline, and I was like, I, I just don't. Something is not. Why is this so? This is almost not depressing, but the further you read into Second Peter, the more you're like, oof, 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 you know? <laughs> so I'm just warning you. <laughs> when all of a sudden you get to chapter two, you're like, well, when's the last time you heard a sermon on Second Peter two? Yeah, it's not a not a go to. No, it's kind of scary. No wonder you were bringing Second in the Peter sheets. Peter three, yeah. And so I'm like, kept reading this, and I kept reading it, and I was like, so then all of a sudden I realized that when Peter made this comment, I kind of I was kind of hanging out where we left off, which I think is verses twelve through 15 uh but we can go back and i think we were gonna we go kind of jumped around we didn't quite flesh out the five before. through yeah, right through nine which is true and, and we can do that because I, I just i'm giving you my epiphanies as yeah. we head to this aha moment okay so but just give you an over overview so okay. if you're if you're just new to the podcast you're like well kind of where we're at well it hit me that when he, he gets real personal in Verse 13, mm -hmm. he gets really personal. He does. He says, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. So you got to realize before I continue to read this. So what age are we thinking Peter is when he's writing this book? Because part of the epiphany that I had came when I realized, you know what? He's right at the end of his life here. Correct. So I don't know what age that was, but you will agree with that. Yes. So that's why I didn't. I mean, know within if, a if, year, if we knew, yeah. So within a year, so I don't, I don't know if we knew when how old Peter was when he died. The guess is that maybe in his fifties. So what back I, then, that's what when I'm you, thinking fifties then was like seventies or eighties. Yeah, now exactly. That, that, I mean, and that's uh, your your age and your age. That's right. Fifties, but it was. I'm saying, relatively speaking, the if you look at the charts of the, uh, what is the phrase I'm looking for? The life expectancy. Yeah. Back then, it was probably fifty. Like right? that, right? Yeah. He would have been. He would have been an older man. Yeah. So that made me realize this because I, I I had a thought here. So you know what happens, and I'll I'll use this as an illustration, and we can discuss this. You know when when. If, if you're, because you do a lot of weddings. Well, if you marry people in their 40s, well, they're way more nervous. They're way more uh, fearful. You, when you marry people when they're teenagers, they're not scared of anything. You know, you do the premarital counseling. I remember we went in there premarital counseling. I was, I was grinning, you know. Like, yeah. And you're like, why? Because we, no matter what was said, I mean, we basically took the compatibility chart and, and his conclusion was don't get married, find somebody else. <laughs> and we held our hands. We, you know, she reached and grabbed my hand, but, but we love each other, you know. Because <laughs> you're just so naive is my point. Right. But the older, they get, the older you get, well, that you realize life has been difficult. It, it's, you realize the dangers and the difficulty in every aspect of life. So what happened? You're smarter. Round, round every curve, there's, there's, there's a new... You, you realize this. So I'm saying the older you get, that's why most older people in the faith come across as grumpy and mean-spirited. And just, you're like, well, why? Because, well, they've been beat up, and they realize the brutality and danger They've been of in life. a battle the last 40, 50 years. Oh, they've been years. in a war. And so I think that's why this goes down this road. And, and to prove that point, it, an outline that you'll never see anywhere is he's basically in the first chapter warning you of the dangers of, of having your heart corrupted. And that's in verse four, when he says, 
Now, the first of it's positive, and we went through it. You know, I want to remind you of the great and precious promises, you know, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. But watch this. It's a little negative here. And escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Because he's realized how corrupt the world is out there. You're not, he doesn't have that being naive. Right. He's like, it's dangerous, and your your heart is dangerous. Evil desires. Well, look what he does in chapter two. It gets, he's like, but there's also false prophets among the people. Do you realize how many, how many times he's had arguments with people about heresies that they thought of? <laughs> and so all of a sudden, he's like, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord. You know, verse two, many will follow their shameful ways and bring the way of truth into dis- disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up. And you're like, I mean, who wants to be exploited? I mean, it's, and then all of a sudden, you know, he's like, their condemnation has been long hanging over them and their destruction has not be, been sleeping. So that's why I said it. You're like, why, why are you so angry? Well, he's not angry. He's just being real to you that there are going to be people that come into your midst and they're going to do all this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing that uh, it's, uh, it's like what was going on 2,000 years ago, and I said, that sounds like us today. Nothing has changed here, Jace. Yeah. You see well, he, he went back 2,000 years to begin that conversation. He went back to the Sodom and Gomorrah. And mm-hmm. That's right. He showed this always been, the spirit of that has always been around. Yep. So anyway, he gets to chapter three, which look, I'm not, we're, we'll get there. But all of a sudden, he brings up this group of people that are saying, well, where is this coming? And, you know, ever since our fathers died, I mean, he's not coming back. You know, boy, he gets to verse 11. He's like, since, I mean, uh, verse 10, he's like, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And you're like, man, he's trying to scare us. Oh, that's exactly what he's trying to do. <laughs> that's scary. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. And so I'm just giving you a thumbnail of that, that I realize that, man, he's he's older. He's real. He's been beat up. He's realized the dangers of your heart, the dangers from other people, and just the, the danger of God himself of looking down at humanity and having to put up, you know, put up with the rebellion and all this. So that kind of, once I kind of had that moment, that was not the big bombshell moment, but it kind of made me realize that that's why it kind of gets difficult. And I mean, I think you should understand that because it does, it seems, I mean, you don't hear many lessons on chapter two and chapter three because it is, it is kind of scary. It's like the On The Way Out Manifesto. Let's take another break. So, Dad, you famously don't have a cell phone. And it's difficult to try to explain to people because I'm happy for them that they have them and they use them and they talk the lingo, but I'm not going to back up or back (laughs) off on whether I need one or not. So a lot of times they listen to our podcast on their cell phone, which is great, right? Great. So so even though Dad doesn't have a cell phone, uh, he understands the need for that. And uh, one of our uh, longtime sponsors, Patriot Mobile, uh, provides cell phone service, and they are the only Christian conservative wireless provider. And the good news is they offer service with all three of the major networks now. That means if you're with the big three uh, and you like the service, but you don't like their values, you can access them with Patriot Mobile. They also offer a performance guarantee. So if you're not happy with your coverage, you can switch between the three major carriers for free. So we like that. Uh, They offer nationwide coverage on the best 4G and 5G networks. So you get the same great service while supporting a company that fights to preserve our God-given rights and freedoms, which we like here at Unashamed. This new year, resolve to stop supporting companies that don't align with your values. They have a 100% U.S.-based customer service team, and it makes switching easy. 
Go to patriotmobile.com slash Phil, or you can call them at 878-PATRIOT. Get free activation today with the offer code Phil. That's patriotmobile.com slash Phil, or you can call them at 878-PATRIOT. So even though you don't have a cell phone, Dad, we got a great service yeah. that supports our podcast. But I don't know where mine is. Is so, your cell phone? Yeah. So either, either you don't have one, you don't know where it is, or you can just call the number. There you go. 878 Patriot. It is scary. it is scary, but it's 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 uh it's interesting to me that his focus cuz he's going to die. I mean, the way he's going to die is coming from a threat which is not the threat that he's actually addressing. Cause he's talking about internal stuff. It's like family business. You know, the, the evil lust, I was thinking of that passage in James one says, but each one is tempted. This is a James one fourteen, when he is carried away and enticed by his own evil lust or evil desires. Uh, your translation may say, then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So looking back at what Peter said, he said, uh, what does he say here? Having escaped the corruption in the world that is by lust, but he's talking about like our internal, I think he's talking about the internal stuff in our own heart. Like we're lusting after these things of the world. And then he, he moves into um, these people that seem to be in the church. Right. I mean, he says that the, they're bringing in destructive heresies. Yeah. My translation says even denying the master who bought them. Oh, so yeah. whoever is bringing in the destructive heresies, the one thing we know about them is that they were bought and purchased by Jesus. That's what yeah. it says here. Oh, that's um, so fantastic. It yes. seems like this is a threat in, inside the church, you know? Oh, there's no doubt. So before I get, because I, you know, I know that was a lot, but I'm saying before I drop the bombshell, and, and I want to just lead this whole time, I feel like it was such an aha moment and that I'm going to wow you with it. I want, I want to keep building it up. <laughs> But I do realize that on the outline we didn't we didn't flesh out five through nine. Right. But I wanted to bring that up overall because here's I I had a I had another epiphany at, during the all night study session, and I think most people when they teach this, they give the they give all the things all the qualities. So you have what you know he says make every effort. To add to your faith, goodness, goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, uh, godliness, brotherly kindness, or mutual affection, most translations say, uh, and then love. <clears throat> so when people teach this, because they're doing like we're doing, but they're right. going through the book, and they're like, well, okay, well, that, if you just get all these things, well, you got it. But I realized something. In studying this, you know, he starts off saying his power has given you everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. And I think to the people who are young in the faith, you're like, really? I've got everything I need because I don't feel that way. Because what? Life is tough, you know, but he's given us everything we need. And he's based all what we need on promises. He says that in verse four. And we're participating in the divine nature, so that's the Holy Spirit. And he's doing this all because he realized how dangerous our hearts can be. So we just, that's kind of where we're at. So he says, so for this reason, make every effort. And I think you had a point about being diligent. So he says this phrase three times, make every effort, which or being diligent. He says it in verse 5, and then he says it in verse verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain. Yeah, that's it. Uh, to be calling. all the more eager. Yeah, I think some translations say, make, when I was looking it up, it said make every effort. So in verse 10 in the NIV, it says all the more eager. But it's the same phrase. Uh, you make every effort to make your calling and election sure for if you do these things. It's actually said three times because then Peter yeah. says it himself as well. I don't know why they translated that in this version of the NIV. I it's, think, Jason, would, uh, uh, your argument is based on the Hebrew writer, chapter 2. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, yeah. to what we've heard 
and here's the way it works, so that we do not drift away, whatever that means. That's right. what Peter's saying. No, I think you're exactly right, Phil. So what yeah. I was going to say, you're exactly right. What I, Here's what I, my point was. It only took 10 minutes to get here, but my point was, so when you do all these things, it's not these are not things you do because you got to think practically. If you have everything you need, well, you got to live here. So what happens is when you wake up in the morning, because he he lists all these qualities that you'll be adding to your your faith, all these things. He says if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will. Now here's the here's the not the bombshell, but the first thing I want to bring up. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. So just think about that. If you have all these qualities, you're going to be effective and productive. You're going to be bringing in the sheaves <laughs> every day with people. So that that's what hit me. His his goal in writing this was not to give you a 10-point plan where if you understand all these concepts, you're going to figure this out. The goal is to wake up every day trying to be effective for Jesus and productive because yep. Jesus is your Lord, and you know him, and you want to represent him, and you want to shout him to the mountains, and you want to introduce him to the person at Walmart, and you want to... So what, so what does a day consist of? It consists of decisions that you make. Now, that's why it's such an array of qualities. Well, in some decisions, you're going to have to control yourself. I mean, let's say, I mean, you could, I could just pluck something out of the air, but let's say, you, you know, you wake up, you know, feeling frisky or whatever, and you're, you're married, which is perfectly fine. That's what married people, you wake up feeling frisky, you know. But your your wife, she's not feel she's not she's not feeling frisky. Right? So we we got an issue here. This had, and you're like, what's this got to do with Peter? Because once she said, I'm not feeling frisky, well, you're gonna have to control yourself. Cause that that went out the window. You know, she she's sick or or whatever. So you had her now you could blow up and say, Well, you know, I'm a so that's going to derail your effectiveness and your productivity in the name of Jesus if you start the day off with the inability to control yourself. But my point is, life happens every day, and you don't know what's going to happen. And I was trying to tie this into why Peter seems like he's coming across a bit angry and a bit, no, it's just he knows how difficult it is on a daily basis to put Jesus at the center of every decision. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult to do it. So when he gets down here and saying, well, you've forgotten, you've near, you're have near, you nearsighted and you've forgotten you've been cleansed from your sins, you're like, well, how do I forget that? We all know that doesn't make any sense. You forget it in the moments every day of life. When life comes your way, all of a sudden, you're not thinking about Jesus dying for your sins. To use my marriage illustration, that's all you're thinking about in that moment, and you have to you have decision. You can either control yourself, be unselfish, realize the big picture, don't let it buy all these things. <laughs> I'm just using one little illustration with one quality, he said, but then all these qualities that come up every day, life happens, and you have these opportunities every day to show these qualities. And if you're waking up, tackling them every day with Jesus as the center, I think this is what he meant. So we're all very active uh, in the pro-life movement in the Robertson family and, and certainly here on Unashamed. Last week uh, or a couple weeks ago, dad was in uh, Mississippi speaking on uh, behalf of a, a pro-life pregnancy center. Yep. Lisa and I do it almost weekly. Tonight we're going to be down in um, on the campus of a, a university, a Christian university here in Louisiana, uh, speaking on behalf of the unborn. Jason and Missy have done fostering and uh, other work, as well as many others in our family. Another group that uh, we're aligned with is a group called 40 Days for Life. And uh, we've had Sean Carney, who is their CEO and their president, on our podcast before. I think we're having him coming up as well. Just a great group. Uh, they do a lot of great work. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned, you know, a lot of people have thought that, you know, kind of the work is over for the pro-life movement. But it actually is just beginning. Yep. 
because now the battle line has kind of moved to the states. And so you got some states that have enacted laws in their states that make it easier for abortion. And so you kind of have everything kind of move into those states. And so the battle lines have kind of been redrawn in our state, Louisiana, a lot of others. Abortion is much more difficult, uh, which we're grateful for. But you've also then had more opportunities because you got a lot of women that at one time had abortion rights and now don't. And so you got to walk alongside these women. So 40 Days for Life is a group uh, that's obviously helping in that battle. They've moved to a lot of those states where abortion uh, is, is more readily available, and they're trying to help women make a better decision. So once you check these guys out, they hold uh, 40-day peaceful vigils uh, to uh, to have women make better decisions uh, when they go into these uh, abortion facilities. And that's what we want to do. Uh, we want you to go to their website, 40daysforlife.com, to check out their facilities, uh, their locations, where they're going to be. They have a free magazine at 40daysforlife.com. Uh, I want you to check them out, see where you can get involved uh, and support this group. He goes on to say, the Hebrew writer, how shall we escape, which is what your point is, if we ignore such a great salvation? It has to rule over pretty well every decision you make. Right. It rules over. It was announced first It was announced first to us, was confirmed by the Lord, announced by the Lord, was, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. And God also testified to it with signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. He's just saying, you can miss this. It'll just fly. Every day. You, you're right missing on by it. You and you didn't even know what You're happened. missing it in your daily life because yep. that's what growing is. You see what I mean? Yep. Yep. If you're growing every day. The language here is is a progressive language, and I love that because that's why I brought up that passage in James, because if you and this is like an interesting discussion when you get into first, uh, Second Peter, same same thing with Hebrews, which is interesting that Phil brought that up, because you know the big thing here, right? Is right when you start reading into this, you start hearing about people who were bought by the master who have now like become agents of heresy and destruction, and there's this warning and the, this whole thing about make your election sure, and you know all these things is like, well, what about the whole debate? on once saved, always saved. I think that's where this kind of heads. And I think if you end up on either side of that debate, you're kind of missing the bigger picture here. Thank you. And and I think it's, it's, it's looking at this idea of sin and righteousness, both on the opposite ends of the spectrum. But the, the, da- the danger of sin is that it, it is a progressive uh, movement toward death. And that's, that's that James passage, right? It's uh, it starts with lust and when lust is conceived, each one is dragged away by their own evil desire or their own evil lust. And then when that desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. And then when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Uh, I'm probably butchering it, but go back and read that. I, I read it earlier. But it's a progression towards death. Yeah, plus Peter was looking at it from his own life. And uh, he came close to losing the prize several times. <laughs> In his own yeah, he, life. He did. And I think that it, it, it yeah, it, if, but if we reframe our idea of sin and faith in the context of these are pro, most both progressive things, one is a progressive cancer, which is sin, starts with temptation, is what it says. Each one is tempted, so temptation, when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust, and there's lust, then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. Now we have sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So that's the progressive nature that's the cancerous nature of sin and then here what he's given in in uh second peter uh, chapter one it's the progressive nature of righteousness that starts with um um let's see here applying an all diligence uh, in your faith uh so you start with faith here moral excellence then you add to moral excellence knowledge then self-control then perseverance then godliness uh, then brotherly kindness for if these qualities are yours, and I love this next phrase, and are increasing, then they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I like that phrase there because it, it, it's, it's highlighting that there's a true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think what he's talking about here 
This isn't like God's information that he's imparting to you. I think it goes back to this, what he said earlier. It's, it's, it's the knowledge of knowing him, which makes you a participator in the divine nature, going back to, to verse four. I think oh, I it's a, a relational interaction. And that's why when we talk about it, the end of that is life itself. Well, you know why? Because God is life. It's, you got to remember, life. You gotta remember oh, yeah. Peter found himself right after he said, Jesus said, I'm going up to Jerusalem. The chief priest teachers of the law are going to kill me. Uh, three days I'll arise from the dead. When Peter writes about it, he says, you look at the, need to look at this, what happened, like a light shining in a dark place. I mean, look what he struggled with until the day dawns or the morning star rises in your hearts. It, it hit him one time and he wasn't buying it. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture. Jesus is the one who said, I'm going to die, be buried and raised from the dead. I'm going to save the world. Peter was the one who jumped in and said, no, you're not. Well, that's how easy you can get be led astray. And he goes on to say, no scripture came about in the prophet's own interpretation. Prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God, including Jesus, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter almost blew blew the deal. You know, yeah. hand picked. Yeah, and, and he's the and that's why he's the perfect guy to oh. write this because he's also at the, he's also at the end of his life. That's right. So he's you know this is around. He, I think he's going to die somewhere between sixty four and sixty eight um, A D. Would have been around 50 years old. I mean, he's lived some life in the Christian faith. So this guy's like walked with this. He's He is obviously under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but even his personal experience, I mean, you, you have to imagine this guy's been walking with the Lord for where a while. Was Je- where, so where, imagine, where was Peter when Jesus said, I'm going to die, be buried, and raised from the dead? When the time got there, where's old Peter? They look around, like, what happened to him? He hit the road. So that's how easy. Well, not only that. Not, well, not only that. He, even even in uh, Paul said that he he had to rebuke Peter to his face when he saw that he wasn't acting in line with the truth of the gospel. Yep. So even post resurrection, Peter still had moral fallings, uh, moral shortcomings, and failures, like all of us do. And so I think that and the he nature was with of this, him. it's not. He was with him, yeah. and he yes, and he had been like casting out demons and performing miracles. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this very flawed man, this ordinary guy, who is writing this letter with incredible wisdom and under the inspiration of the Spirit. But I think what he's laying out to Jace's point too is that this is not because you read this, it is scary. I mean, you start thinking about man, you, you get into the whole dog returning to its vomit, which we'll get into, and all that. I mean, it's the language is very graphic. Yes, but I think what he's laying out here. It's this idea that, man, when you walk in sin, like sin will corrupt you. False teaching will corrupt you. These things will corrupt what you desire at its core. And 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 at the end of that, what it looks like, it looks like a dog who just threw up and then he went back and ate his own throw up, which yep. is a, a disgusting <laughs> thought. <laughs> I mean, great, great picture. I mean, it's what he says, great right? Picture, Zach. Let's, uh, what he says. Let's, let's take our last break. So uh, before uh, before we leave this section, I, I wanted to make one point um, because I thought it was interesting that each one of these qualities are the fruit of something. Because he starts out in three and four with the divine power. The only thing we really bring to the table in verse five is faith, right? That's the only thing we really have to bring to, is the starting point. Well, right. But faith. he says to make every effort, and he says it three times. I didn't read the third one. Uh I don't think I did, but in chapter three, uh, when it says, man, I'm having trouble finding these things. Uh, he, he says it again yeah, in verse 14, 314. So then, dear, fr- mm-hmm. dear friend, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. It's actually the fourth time that phrase is mentioned in this book. So... I wanted to bring this up because when you read this, you're like, well, wait a minute. If his divine power has given us everything we need and it's based on his promises, why is Peter saying make every effort? Which is Because he says it three times. He says it in verse five, make every effort to add to your faith these things. 
Then he says in 10, make every effort to make your calling an election sure. Even though it's translated in, the, in my version of a all the more eager, it's the same word because I looked it up. And then when he says it here, now you got to remember, we hadn't got to chapter three yet, but this scary sight about the earth burning up and and having a new now now we're like yeah but we're on the we're on the good side of this yeah but it's still kind of scary language when you start thinking about the earth being a ball of question is asked Uh, what kind of people should you be well exactly (laughs) and then all of a sudden he's talking about being blameless and spotless you're like well i i thought i couldn't I, i couldn't do this so that last little thing he says is what I wanted to zero in on. And that pe- before you, hey, you got to say, Jace, real quick, yeah. that is the question. I, I don't want to, like, before you give the answer, I, I, I think we should highlight this. I mean, this is the question. I don't even know where you're going. I think, I think you're going to, I'm anxious, but the question always is Christ did it all. Mm hmm. But I got to do something. Well, and, right. And, you, and how do you like what? How do you reconcile? He did it. It's the finished work of Christ. But then I got to make an effort. Wait, wait. What is this? Who's doing what? What's my responsibility? What's his? What's well? That's, I mean, that is a big question. It's a big question, and that's why I think the translations are all over the place on make, that. Make every effort. Like the other translation says, be diligent. But I don't even know if we use that word anymore. I mean, what we actually talked about that. But what does that mean? I mean, we can come up with a thumbnail. The, you know, this says be all the more eager, which I kind of like that better in that one tr- translation. So, no matter what happens, stay the course. But this one little last phrase he says, be blameless and spotless. But it says this phrase, I love it, and at peace with him, which goes back to Zach's point about this knowledge. Uh, of of Jesus being more relational than informational. Because when he says, when he uses it the first time in verse 5, he says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, you know, goodness, knowledge. And so I do think it is in that in that relationship experience of surrendering on a daily basis to the will of God you know, listening to the Holy Spirit, the communication lines are open. You studying God's word, you listening to spirit filled people, uh, and and your prayer life, all, all the things that people usually connect with being a good Christian, they are true. That is the signs of a relationship, but you're not it, it's what they're based on. You're not doing them to achieve salvation or or status, you know, before God, it's more of a daily walk. That's why I I said these these qualities happen on a daily basis. It's not like you're going to gather all the information on what does really self-control mean and, you know, knowledge and perseverance. If I knew what those meant, then I could go put them in my life. No, it's not it's not going to work that way. It's more acknowledging that you have the Spirit of God and He has a mission for you to do to represent Him. And as you go through life, minute by minute, you're you're making decisions, surrendering to God's will and putting Jesus forward out there. But think about each one of those, Jays. What is goodness? It's fruit of the Spirit. It's not your goodness. What is knowledge? It's it's fruit of prophecy. What is self-control? Fruit of the Spirit. What's perseverance? Fruit of trial and suffering. What is godliness? It's fruit of Christ, not you. Exactly. What is kindness? Fruit of the Spirit. All those are fruit of something else. So the making every effort is actually a surrendering spirit to the to the character of God. Exactly. on, On a well, that's why he said, when you don't do these things, you're forgetting that Jesus died for you. Yes. So that's what I wanted to go back to. It, it's what motivates you to surrender to Christ. Well, the the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's it's always going to go back to the gospel and your reenactment of it, which is the first reenactment part of that is you dying, which is the surrendering your will. But what I was trying to say, you can you can have discussions about this and and from thirty thousand feet. Where this gets difficult is when you wake up in the morning and you're faced with these decisions because your your nature, your desires, the danger of your heart, and Peter addresses that in verse four. 
He knows that in the short term, we easily forget our surrendering, you know, who Jesus is, the death on a cross. You forget that in the short term. Well, if you do that, for two days in a row, all of a sudden you're you're, you're drift. You do it for a week. You do it for a month. You're drifting. You, you, it, here, you're you're, here you're not forming. growing. And when you're not growing, guess what you're doing? You're dying. Remember Peter's words, the same one that he's alerting us now in the first and second Peter. Peter took him aside, Jesus is, and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happened to you. The very heart of the salvation of the human race. Peter at one point in his life said, this will not happen ever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he, that boy, that boy, that didn't come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I, I would argue the reason why Peter said that and the, it was because he did not understand the nature of the kingdom. My translation says this, um, the NASB, that when we practice these things, um, as long as you practice these things, you'll never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. So it's, it's to Jace's point, and I think this is it. We're talking about the upside down kingdom and how do we live the kingdom life. And it's almost like he's saying you, you practice these things, you practice the way. And when you practice the way, the truth and the life, who is Jesus, then the kingdom is actually applied to you. Exactly. And I think this is explained really, really good at the end of Romans uh, chapter nine. We'll save that. When he went through this whole. Save that for the overtime. Yep. Because the old clock on the wall says that's about all. But I'm glad where you've come to an agreement on this and if you're wondering if i ever dropped the aha but no i haven't because i and i'm not going to do it in the overtime i'm going to give you another teaser because i want to have a full podcast to drop the bombshell <laughs> oh moment the bombshell is yet it, to come it comes as a teaser from verse 15 of chapter 1, which we never got to. Never got to. So in, so hold that Romans thought. We'll do that in overtime. BlazeTV.com slash unashamed. If you want to catch uh, Zach's uh, Romans explanation and uh, as, as well as other things, follow us over for our overtime segment. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.